Hi guys, uh, welcome back. And uh, after a long, stressful, hard week, um, it's a pleasure to be here uh, with you all um, and with our esteemed panel once again. Um, we'll introduce um, it very shortly and let them introduce themselves in a bit, but um, you will know them as Elna, Bitrian, uh, Paul Healy and Maria and myself um, from the last set of uh, sessions that we gave. And it's an honor to be back and um, sort of um, being able to be interactive and do what we, what we need to do, which is learn off each other and help improve care for all our patients. So um, a bit of a background uh, for today. Um, we'll move on to showing you a video of what we're talking about, just for those who haven't implanted. But the background is that we know, um, and there's a big study, a 10 year retrospective study that showed Cataract surgery brings down the pressure. In glaucoma patients, that's around 1.9 millimeters uh, of mercury. We know in ocular hypertensives, it's a little bit more, maybe up to eight millimeters of mercury. Is eye stent, trabecular stents with cataract surgery effective? Uh, that's debatable and we can look at that a little bit more in Paul's excellent uh, PowerPoint uh, presentation. What we don't know is is eye stent effective alone? There's been no published data and that's the purpose of today. The advantage for that for us glaucoma surgeons who know that generally uh, glaucoma surgery, you're buying time. And with filtration surgeries, which we know brings down the pressure about 10 millimeters of mercury on average, incurs risks. And those risks, the most grave of those risks are something that we're keen to avoid. So in this paper, we've looked at, uh, Paul's group has looked at 13 studies, including RCTs, with a total of 778 eyes. And I found it quite e extremely interesting uh, as a majority of these patients were phakic. And then we can look into how many of these patients require cataract surgery, because conceptually we think, well, if we're doing stuff in the eye with helon in, liberating a little bit of heme, you'd expect cataracts to accelerate. So we'll look into all of that. So just to start off, um, Elena, can we just uh, narrate the video uh, that's been kindly donated to us by my mentor, uh, Mr. Faisal Ahmed um, from the Western Eye? Absolutely. So we have here an intraoperative view uh, of a Swan Jacob lens. Uh, we're visualizing the angle. And then um, it looks like this is a combined cataract uh, case. So there's some viscoelastic introduced in the eye. The view of the angle is really, really good. You can see the trabecular meshwork and the scleral spur. And now um, we're going to introduce the instrument. Dr. Ahmed is introducing the, this is a first generation eye stand. That's the snorkel eye stand. So he's going to do a movement, a sideways movement with the instrument and inserting piercing through the trabecular meshwork and then releasing, pressing the release button and releasing the snorkel uh, eye stand here. You can see uh, some blood reflux that it's very uh, common after the placement of those eye stands. And here you can check the position, which is perfectly placed in trabecular meshwork as well. I personally found those uh, first generation eye stands a little harder to place. And I was happy when the second generation came in. <laughs> I second that motion. <laughs> and as Elena has beautifully narrated, it's a conduit, uh, which we learned about in Paul's paper, which is a fistula direct from the anterior chamber to Schlem's canal, bypassing the greatest part of resistance. So Maria is going to put up the second video of what we find generally slightly more easier implantation. And this is also a video from Dr. Faisal Ahmed. And we will see the second generation eye stands. Uh, they come two in the injector. So that's uh, another advantage. We can get two devices and uh, theoretically a little more effect. So you can see here how he has the injector. This injector has a needle in the center. That needle is positioned on the uh, trabecular meshwork. We indent and do like a little dimple. And then uh, there's a release button that, that we press on, on the side and just injects one of the uh, eye stands and we have it placed there with a little reflux. Then we move a little sideways, uh, at least one to three clock hours. And then we will uh, indent again with a little needle, press the release button, and that just like uh, ejects the second uh, eye stand. Those are a little bit smaller than the snorkel eye stand. Um, 
and for me it's like uh, easier to place i do think where you put the injector is when where it's gonna um, end up the eye stand being and there's a little injection of viscoelastic to visualize that the eye stands are perfectly placed where we want and they are perfectly placed on a trabecular meshwork so just for the audience this this shows beautifully why it's important that we use patients with open angles and in Paul's paper, he looks at his cohort of POAG, PXF, PDS for this reason, um, so that you've got visualization of the angle to implant the eye stents. And uh, we can see that the position with those, that injector um, can be as close or ideally a little bit farther like so uh, as possible. Um, so thank you very much, Anna. Uh, what, what I'd like from the audience is if you could kindly write questions um, in the chat, put your hand up. We want to make it as um, interactive as possible. Um, but I'd like now for, um, to introduce Professor Paul Healy, who wrote this beautiful paper, who's going to educate us now on, uh, on, on standalone eye stents. Paul, please uh, share your screen. Uh, thank you very much. That should be the one. Okay, can everyone see the uh, title slide up there? Yes, we can. Yes, good, excellent. So um, you've just seen some great looking surgery. Uh, looks really easy, who wouldn't wanna do it? Um, but there are a few questions um, which we need to answer before we, uh, we grab our next uh, eye stent and take the plunge. So first of all, let's just remind ourselves what the intraocular glaucoma stents are. They're prostheses. They're implanted intraocularly and they're designed to lower intraocular pressure. There are three mechanisms uh, by which intraocular glaucoma stents can work. The first is uh, in the eye stents we just saw, what I'd call a goniostomy, I and started calling it a goniotomy, but really it's a goniostomy because we're creating a permanent fistula um, into the canal of SLEM through the trabecular meshwork. Uh, we can also dilate the canal ab interno um, and stent it. And lastly, we can create a cyclodialysis cleft and devices have been uh, created and uh, approved for all three. Um, the device for the cyclodialysis cleft was withdrawn um, worldwide uh, a year or so ago. Uh, this is the hydra stent, which creates the goniostomy as well as stenting and dilating the canal. Uh, the subject of today's talk is the uh, eye stent, uh, which you can see down here. I don't quite know why all these prostheses are always displayed on American coinage. Um, it's either something to do with how small they are or perhaps um, how much money the companies hope to make from them. So, here at this great eye stent, um, you've seen the advertisements, should you use it? So let's ask ourselves, how do we approach new surgical treatments? Uh, we need to be logical, we need to be rational, and we need to look at the evidence. So let's go back to our uh, medical, medical school evidence-based medicine principles. The first question we have to answer is, is this treatment relevant to my practice? If you're a 75 year old retinal surgeon on the verge of retirement, this is probably not that relevant or interesting. And you can probably just stop there. If, however, you have glaucoma patients, if you perform surgery on those patients, then this is something perhaps you need to know about. Number two, is there consistent high quality evidence of efficacy and safety of disease related and patient related outcomes? That is a bit of a mouthful. Um, and it's probably a, um, more extensive requirement that you then you may have um, uh, learnt in uh, medical school. So let's unpack it a bit. Firstly, there needs to be consistent evidence. In other words, we need multiple studies um, and they need to show similar results. The quality needs to be high. Now, this isn't just in terms of uh, the quality of the study. Uh, we know that randomised controlled trials um, are usually superior in their trial design to a cohort study or a non-randomized study. And a systematic uh, review or meta-analysis um, of randomized controlled trials is probably the best evidence we have. But it's also that within the study itself, the data was well collected and well analyzed. Just be, being an RCT doesn't guarantee high quality data. 
Um, it all depends on how it was done. What about the disease and patient related outcomes? Well, disease related outcomes are what we've been focused on for many, many years. Patient related outcomes are things we should have been focused on, but weren't. Um, what's the difference between a disease and a patient related outcome in glaucoma? Well, I can guarantee you that if I take a patient with early glaucoma and I perform a trabeculectomy and the patient has a pressure of one for the rest of their life, that will be an extremely good disease related outcome. I can guarantee they won't go blind from glaucoma. However, it's quite likely that the pressure of one will create intractable macular edema. Um, and therefore from the patient's perspective, that is not a good outcome. It is really important, uh, particularly as we move forward to the 21st century, to have a patient centered approach to our treatment. And while our job is to make sure glaucoma doesn't progress, we don't wanna do that um, to the detriment of our patient. Thirdly, we need to ask ourselves an important question of how this new technology compares with established treatment that I already use. If you can already do an operation for glaucoma and it works well, you need to ask yourself whether it's worthwhile learning a new procedure um, and whether that's going to benefit your patients. There's a few more questions we need to answer, answer once we've asked those. What is the expected learning curve? Remember, this is a surgical procedure. It's not an eye drop. Um, when you see those uh, lovely videos, that is someone who's practiced the procedure. So you need to ask yourself, what's the learning curve? How long will it take? Is this like a, a FACO where you'll need several years of close supervision to become a comp uh, proficient? Or is it like a laser trabeculoplasty where you can see one, one or two and then you can get on and do it? And you need to ask yourself this because you need to think about your outcomes during your learning period. Right? If you're going to blind the first dozen patients you do this procedure in, then you know, it may not be such a good deal for those patients. How will it impact my clinical decision making in my practice? And will it de-skill me in some other treatment? So you need to think about, am I going to be offering this treatment to every new glaucoma patient that walks in? Will this replace 95% of my trabeculectomies? And if it does, how good am I going to be doing a trabeculectomy if I only do it once a year? And lastly, is this cost effective in my practice? And that's a complicated question because that is dependent on where you practice. It depends on uh, the wealth of your country as to what a, a reasonable amount of money is. And it also depends on your culture as to what you think is important in terms of quality of life outcomes. So let's have a look at this with respect to the eye stents. Um, and we'll start with a, a study done by one of my colleagues, Nathan Kerr from um, uh, Melbourne, looking at the evidence for efficacy of the eye stent when performed uh, in, uh, in patients who have also having cataract surgery. And the reason for this is that if you look at the literature, this is the vast majority of uh, papers, why we'll, we'll get onto in a minute. And so if you look at these studies, you'll see a few things. Firstly, Fortunately, if you compare the preoperative to the postoperative intraocular pressure, you see that all the studies of eye stent in combination with cataract surgery lower the pressure. That's a pretty good first point, right? It doesn't raise the pressure. Um, although in one study, you couldn't be certain whether it actually lowered the pressure or not, but it probably did. How much does it lower it? Well, it lowers it about four millimeters. But if you look across the studies, there's a great deal of heterogeneity, right? In other words, a study of the same thing has shown a very different outcome. Anything from perhaps nine millimeters of mean pressure lowering uh, to perhaps only one or two. And if you know anything about the stents and the stent studies, you'll know that hand in hand with a pressure reduction goes changes in medications because pretty much all of these studies have allowed the uh, investigator to achieve target pressure postoperatively with whatever means comes to hand medically, which means if the pressure is very good postoperatively, the medications may reduce. If the pressure is a bit high, they may increase. It is a less than clean approach to, um, to a trial, but it is a pragmatic one and it reflects um, the way we behave in clinical practice. And again, if you look at the uh, medication reduction, you'll see that overall there's a reduction of about one eye drop. But again, great heterogeneity across the studies. So if we look at the studies altogether, as I said, a touch under 
four millimetres of pressure lowering from pre to post operative. Uh, that's at 12 months and about one medication reduction. If we look at the longer term, 24 to 60 months, uh, there are fewer studies in this group, uh, but still a reasonable number of eyes. You see 100, 840. Um, we see a fairly consistent pressure lowering, which is good. So this isn't a, a, a treatment which wears off after a year and a fairly similar um, change in the reduction of medicine. What about randomized versus non-randomized study? That's always important in a, in a meta-analysis, particularly early on in a device's development when the number of randomized eyes at 129 is substantially less than the non-randomized eyes at 1,602. Um, we do see a signal here which we need to take notice of, which is that the randomized results are not quite as good as the non-randomized results. That always raises a few flags um, as, um, uh, as somebody who reads the literature because you know we know the point of randomization is to try and randomize the potential confounders um, and the biases. Um, and uh, perhaps there is some sort of bias slipping in here if we see this difference. What about the stents? We saw there are two different stents, the eye stent, the eye stent inject. Um, not much of a difference, a, a slightly better outcome by the looks of things for the eye stent inject, although no fewer studies. Um, and lastly, what about the number of stents? It doesn't seem to make much of a difference actually whether you use one, two or three stents. Um, the results seem to be pretty much the same. What about safety? That's obviously a very important consideration in operation. Well, if we take one of the key uh, studies for this um, device, which is the Samuelson's 2011 um, uh, RCT, which was um, important in the FDA approval for this uh, device, we see that the safety profile is actually very good. And that's one of the appealing things about these, all these devices. If we look at anticipated early post-operative post events, which has mean, means any of those relatively minor post-operative sequelae we'd expect of a cataract, such as some stri, a little bit of inflammation, um, you see that it's very similar between the two groups. Um, you will, will note a few stent-related complications, which obviously can only occur in the stent group, but these are low, um, under 5%. Um, and we're not seeing anything that would be worrying, such as macular edema, um, or you know, extended um, inflammation or um, uh, pressure elevation. And even the things like stent malpositions and the need for stent removal uh, here in this secondary surgical interventions is actually very low. So reassuring. Um, interestingly, when you look at this study, almost a third of patients in both groups needed a paracentesis on day one, uh, which sounds to me like they didn't do a very good job removing the viscoelastic at the end of the study. However, they removed it equally badly in both cases, I mean, both um, the eye stent and the non-eye stent groups. So uh, there's the, the benefit of randomization. However, there's an elephant in the room as uh, Gersh suggested. Um, and, you know, I had to actually extract this from the text of the results of this paper because it doesn't appear in any table or any um, figure. When you look at the abstract, it's all about percentage of patients achieving this and achieving this, uh, achieving that. What I'd like to do is draw your attention to the second line here. The mean reduction in intraocular pressure at 12 months compared with preoperative unmedicated baseline pressure was 8.4 plus or minus 3.6 millimeters in the treatment group, which is fantastic, at 8.4 millimeter pressure lowering. However, the control group, in other words, the group that only had cataract surgery, they apparently didn't have a glaucoma procedure, had a pressure drop that was slightly better. 8.5 millimetres plus or minus 4.3. If we look at post-op pressures versus mean medicated pressures pre-op, we see the eye stent are slightly better, one and a half millimetres versus one, but look at the um, uh, standard error, it's three millimetres. So the problem is that while the group who had eye stent and cataract had an excellent pressure lowering, the group who had cataract surgery had an excellent pressure lowering as well. And that must make you ask the question, you know, what is the main cause of the good results in these patients? So this is the problem with combined studies of eye stent and cataract. Um, this is the paper from the OAT study. Um, as you know, a large um, cohort uh, of patients with the ocular hypertension, some of whom um, for reasons unrelated to their randomization, needed cataract surgery. And this is what happens when you do cataract surgery in someone with ocular hypertension. You get a very profound and sustained pressure lowering. And as it's been mentioned, this isn't quite as profound if you're not quite as high a pressure as this, 
Um, but remember the patients in the ISENT trial all started with fairly high pressures. So they you know, represent more closely an OATS type uh, patient than a, a, um, an average glaucoma patient whose pressure is gonna be lower. And we can see that you know, about 16% had a very substantial, more than 30% pressure decrease and another 23% had a 20 to 29% pressure decrease. So in other words, um, the results were very good with cataract surgery. So this study I just showed you and the studies in this meta-analysis are not studies of vision restoring operation versus the vision restoring operation plus a pressure lowering operation. These are studies of one IOP lowering procedure versus two IOP lowering procedures performed at the same time. So, why on earth do a combined trial? Well, there actually is a good reason for it. First and foremost, ease of recruitment, right? More glaucoma patients have cataract surgery than have glaucoma surgery. And what kills a clinical trial is a lack of patience when you're recruiting. So if I was designing an RCT to test anything that you could put in with a cataract operation, I'd do it with a cataract op. Secondly is safety. This is a new device, right? The benefit of doing a combined trial is that the additional risk of this device is marginal over the risk you've already taken. You've had a cataract surgery, you're already risking infection, you're already risking bleeding, you're already risking uh, endothelial damage. So the additional risk of the eye stent is relatively small compared to the risk of the cataract. And thirdly, the population relevance, and this perhaps is more to do with marketing than medicine. Um, more glaucoma patients have cataract surgery than glaucoma surgery, as I said in point one which means a study in those patients is more likely to attract surgeons who are doing that sort of surgery. So how do we explain the results I've just presented? Well, one explanation could be that eye stents don't work well. The second explanation could be eye stents do work well, but cataract surgery just works just as well. So that's the title of my talk. Isn't it just the cataract surgery at lowest pressure really well? But there's a third option that we need to consider which is that concurrent cataract surgery alters the effects of eye stents. Now that means it might make them better, which would be pretty sad, wouldn't it? Because really the, the um, you know, results aren't profound, but perhaps the cataract surgery actually makes the eye stent outcome worse. And if this were the case, then we'd be ditching eye stents um, when they actually are just being used in the wrong scenario. So that was the reason we did the study that's just come out in Journal of Glaucoma, because you know, my feeling and also my experience early on, we've been lucky in Australia to have um, intraocular glaucoma stents since, uh, well, uh, for me, since the early trials in the early 2000s. Um, and, you know, um, when my colleagues ask me what my indication is, and I tell them my indication is desperation, it means that we've tried everything else. And when you try some of these things and they work spectacularly, you have to ask yourself, if it works for one patient, does it have a future? So what I was particularly interested in when I looked at my own clinical data, I got the feeling that these stents work better in standalone than in my cataract patient. Um, but anecdote is not enough. So we needed something else. So what we needed and what we got was a, a paper in General Glaucoma, which was a systematic review and meta-analysis of standalone eye stents. And as Gersh said, there's very little data in the literature about this. So we're going to specifically ask What's the applicability in different patient populations? Remember, all glaucoma patients aren't the same. And you've got to know when you look at data and look at evidence for effectiveness and safety, whether it applies not just to glaucoma patients, but to the patient you have in front of you. We're going to obviously look for evidence of efficacy and safety. We're going to look at duration of effect. You know, we, it does seem in combination with cataract surgery, the results last many years, but that Oates paper I showed you shows that the pressure lowering from cataract surgery last many years. And last, we need to ask that important question about study design. Seeing that signal in the systematic meta-analysis for the combined surgery, where randomized studies show poorer outcomes is an important signal. We're gonna look for that signal in standalone pay, uh, trials as well. So this is what we did. This is a, a, a Prisma flowchart. Um, if you don't know about Prisma, it's worthwhile looking up. It's a sort of standardized methodology for assessing the literature for systematic reviews. Um, we use Embase, Medline, Medline and Cochrane to uh, identify about 760 uh, records. Um, they were screened for eligibility. Um, we then 
took the full text article and analysed them. Some of them were simply reports um, of trials that were uh, underway. Um, some of them uh, combined both standalone and cataract uh, patients and we couldn't differentiate them. So we ended up with 20 um, articles describing 13 unique studies. Interesting of that, those articles, we had an additional four, which we identified. One of the things that's important to do that I like to in a systematic review and meta-analysis is actually contact the investigators and authors for all the papers to find out if there's other data they haven't yet presented. And so there were actually four studies that the uh, investigators indicated to us were underway at the time we performed this review. And uh, during the review period, those studies were published. And so we used that additional data. A lot of that data was follow-up data on previous studies, but it is important to get the most complete data set you can when you're doing a um, systematic review. What about the applicability of patient populations? Well, if we look on the left here at this treatment algorithm, I think most of you would agree this is a, a pretty reasonable treatment algorithm. Uh, we diagnose the patient, we start with conservative therapies, uh, we then um, add uh, therapies, and then uh, when they fail, we go to a incisional uh, glaucoma uh, operation. And that often reflects um, uh, the um, number of medications um, as a surrogate for the stage of the disease. These papers didn't give us good ideas about mean deviation or cup disc ratio or nerve fibre layer thickness. Um, so what did we have? Well, the nice thing is, is that we had a nice spread of papers. So as you can see on that um, table on the right, we have a few studies for newly diagnosed or treatment naive patients, including an RCT. We have um, a number of studies with uncontrolled pressure on one medication, including RCTs. Um, on two medications, including RCTs, on two or three medication, including an RCT, and a small number of non-randomized studies where, in fact, the patients recruited for the trial were going to have incisional surgery. So that's the whole gamut of the kind of patients we see in our practice. And that is important in working out whether these um, results we're going to discuss are generalizable. So what do we find? Well, this is the... Uh, um, sort of the ballpark result. It's like the grayscale in the visual field, right? It gives you a nice overview, not much detail. Um, what does it tell us? Well, it tells us, first of all, that the medicated pre-op pressures, if you look at the far left, were what we'd expect for someone who you wouldn't be terribly happy with, right? Somewhere between 18 and, what, 22, 23? Um, you know, not great for a um, glaucoma patient, but probably better than what they came in with. And then when they were washed out at baseline, BLD, you can see they were running mid to high pressures. So Right, these are a high pressure group immediately. So let's just forget about all those NTDG patients you're thinking about doing stents on because we're not studying these patients. Then what happened when we put the stent on? Well, you know, the ones who had the highest pressures didn't come down strikingly well, but the vast majority of them, the pressures, but you know, mean pressures are between what, 12 and 15? That, that's a pretty reasonable result. And if you look tracking across to month 60, well, of course, you're gonna have a dropout of papers there's no major changes. You look at those lines, some of them go up, some of them go down a bit. My interpretation of that would be the pressures are roughly the same, but maybe there's a little bit of a tendency for the pressures to go up. So at first glance, um, you know, they look like they work and they work reasonably well. Um, if we look in the data, uh, you know, in a little more detail, that's exactly what we find. But note that heterogeneity, just like in those combined studies, right? There are pressure lower drops of less than two millimeters, and there are pressure drops of 12 millimetres. And these are meant to be the same patients having the same procedures. We have to believe that the surgeons know what they're doing, that these stents are actually in the right place. Um, so something is causing that and we need to know what it is. What is our mean, uh, or rather our weighted mean uh, difference between pre and post-op? It's seven millimetres. Now remember for combined, we found it was about four. So there is what I thought, you know, clinically before we started the study. Um, a much better pressure lowering with standalone stents than with combined stents. And that was about a 30% pressure reduction, which is very decent. You know, it's as good as you're gonna get with a good medication. What about changes in medications? Well, interestingly, when we look at the change from baseline down the bottom there, the weighted average change in baseline, it's about the same as it was in the combined study, which is sort of interesting, isn't it? It's one point something. That actually makes sense. You might think that doesn't make sense because the pressure lowering is so much better with the individual stent, but you know, you can't reduce half a medication, can you? Right? You've either got to 
reduce one or you reduce two or reduce none. So it's got to be much closer to two for you to reduce two. These aren't cataract patients. These are glaucoma patients. And the reason for the stent in many of the patients was that the pressure wasn't controlled on a number of medications. So these are patients where you're probably going to be more keen to get a lower pressure because as I showed you, they represent a more, uh, they represent a wider spectrum of disease with more advanced disease. So, you know, if I was doing them, I'd probably keep that medication rather than stopping it if it meant my pressure was 13 rather than 16 or 17. What about um, in the long term? So here is the data for the 30 to six month, 60 month period. Reassuringly, that mean pressure difference is about seven millimeters, well, 6.59, pretty close, and still about a 30% pressure reduction. So reassuring. Again, heterogeneity is there. We really need to look into it. Um, not a big difference between the 36 to 48 month studies and the 60 month studies. So that's important. So it's not as if there's a sudden loss of effective in a 60 month. You look at those three, I mean, there are only three studies, um, only less than 100 eyes, but um, sorry, two studies, less than 100 eyes but uh, they do seem to be consistent. So let's look at that important detail about effect of study type and other factors which may influence the heterogeneity of these results. Uh, sorry, let's first look at uh, post-operative post adverse events, I'm sorry. Um, and this is a tough call because these patients, the, the ones where the studies were randomized, were randomized against medical therapy. So, you know, this is a surgery versus medicine. We would expect a fair few or higher complications, wouldn't we, with um, surgery. In particular, as was mentioned, we'd be worried about causing a cataract. The problem we have if we don't have a comparative arm is that you know, our patients are in the age group who get cataract. So you, know, you can't really tell if you've done an eye stand, the patient gets cataract three years later. You can't tell whether or not they're going to develop the cataract because, because of this um, or despite the procedure. We know that from the normal tension glaucoma procedure uh, when cataract occurred in both groups. And what is, I think, reassuring, if you look at these uh, top group here of the surgery related complications, they're very small, you know, at most 1.9%. So there's one patient in a study. So what we can say is as a standalone procedure, complication rates from the surgery are very low. If we look at those worrying things like cataract, um, we see that there's actually no difference. If we look at progression of cataract, we're looking at 29% in the stent group and 31% in the medical therapy group. Now, you know, um, eye drops probably contribute to cataract. There's evidence to suggest that, but doing an eye stent doesn't contribute more. Um, there is a higher rate of cataract surgery, interestingly, in the stent group than the medical therapy group. Um, now, you know, that seems a bit surprising when the rates of cataract were the same. You know, I suspect part of that, I can't tell you the entire answer, but I suspect part of that is the fact that this group of patients have already had an operation. So they're gonna have a much lower threshold to have another operation. Whereas these other patients have had, had never had surgery. So there's a bigger hurdle to get over. So let's go to that whole important uh, analysis, um, looking at the effect of randomization versus non-randomization and, um, different types of stents and uh, the different effects of the pressure lowering throughout the range of different types of glaucoma. So three really important things. So let's get over the, the randomized control study first of all. Um, interestingly, if we look at all randomized trials and all non-randomized trials, there's not much difference. We've got about a seven millimeter difference in the randomized trials. We've got about an eight millimeter difference in the non-randomized trials. So for whatever reason, um, non-randomized trials actually did a pretty good job of dividing the, the, the cohort um, and there are no major biases. So that's good. It means that we can trust more the non-randomized data and that's important because it makes up a large proportion of the signals that we're getting here. Um, what about stent type? Again, there's um, not much difference between the um, uh, first generation and the second generation stent. Now, Again, this is a single eye stent G1, or that, that snorkel eye stent, and two um, eye stent G2s or eye stent injects, but that's standard of care. Um, and that's probably why the manufacturers gave us two when they gave us the eye stent inject. There does seem to be a signal here, unlike the combined group with the number of stents, although this is not a large number of 
um, studies, there's a reasonable number of eyes. Um, one cent doesn't do as well as two, and three seems to do better than better than two. And I guess that 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 would be logical. You'd think, you know, the reason there are two eye stents in the eye stent injected because two works better than one. Um, it's interesting we didn't see that signal in the combined study. Cataract was somehow interfering with it. If we look at the surrogates for disease severity, newly diagnosed one prior, two prior, three prior medications or incisional surgery indicated. Let's just take away the newly diagnosed. There isn't a big difference between the outcomes on the one, two, three and incisional surgery, which is reassuring. In other words, as the disease gets more advanced within this group, um, the results are pretty similar. Uh, for the newly diagnosed group, that was a huge reduction there, um, a relatively small number of eyes, but almost a 12 millimeter reduction. So that's sort of an outlier, but you know, it may be the case that in fact, you know, when the disease is early, when all the downstream pathways from the trabecular mesh are working well, when the disease is only in the trabecular mesh work, that these stents work very well. It may be that medication do something to the downstream pathways that we don't know about, or maybe just it's part of disease progression. You know, the other reason, of course, might just be the same reason we find that when we add a medication in medical trials, we don't do as well as using that medication in the naive patient. That once the pressures come down to a degree, that, you know, it's going to be harder to get it lower. But in any case, it is reassuring that for patients who are already on conservative therapy, the stent seems to do relatively well at every um, disease severity, noting, of course, that the more severe ends have fewer patients, and therefore wider confidence intervals. So let's try and summarize what we've, uh, what we've seen this, uh, today. I think it's fair to say that eye stents lower intraocular pressure a bit better than cataract surgery when they're both done at the same time. It's about four millimeters and about, you know, minus one medications, which is okay if you're at 20 and it comes down to 16. Not that okay if it's 24 and it comes down to 20, I guess. I stents lower pressure much better if they use standalone. That's about seven millimeters of mercury, so almost twice as well as when they're done in combination. And also with one less medication. That is something that's certainly more worthwhile, right? If, we, if I did a laser trabeculoplasty and I got seven millimeters of pressure lowering, I'd be pretty happy with it. And the IP lowering effect for both modes of surgery does appear to be lasting at least five years without a really noticeable increase over time. Implanting eye stents in conjunction with cataract surgery is safe if you know how to do it. I think that's reasonable. Um, inserting them standalone also appears to be safe and doesn't appear to cause vision loss or progression of cataract, which is very reassuring. And standalone eye stents may have IOP benefits at all stages of a glaucoma. But remember, they lower the pressure more when the starting pressure is higher. What I overlooked when I um, showed you the, the um, uh, paper, I'll actually go back to it because it's quite important if I can. Uh, what I didn't show you was the outcomes associated with different baseline intraocular pressures. And what you can see is that the higher the pressure, the better the pressure lowering. Um, this isn't really surprising if you think about how these um, uh, devices work, because you know that you're not going to get pressure below episcleral pressure um, if you do any intraocular surgery. And you know there's some resistance in the distal outflow system beyond the clown of slim. So, you know, if you get episcleral and you add uh, post canal outflow resistance, you'll end up with a pressure somewhere between 13 and 15, won't you? Um, why? Well, you know, an average pressure in a normal eye, which doesn't have glaucoma and it's got a perfectly functioning trabecular meshwork is a little bit higher than that, isn't it? It's about 16. So, you know, this device doesn't lower the pressure by 50%. It lowers the pressure between 12 and 15. So if you start with 30, you're going to get a large numerical drop in pressure. And if you start with 20, you're going to get a much smaller drop. But really, you know, when less interested in what the percentage drop is, aren't we? We're more interested in our pressure target. So what the data tells us that if our pressure target is, you know, 13 to 16, these stents are good. If our pressure target is six to 10, um, they're unlikely to be effective. 
However, there are still a few things we need to work out. The heterogeneity between IOP outcomes cannot entirely be, explain, be explained by the disease state, the initial pressure or the medication change. I didn't show you the data, but when we looked at the data, we couldn't fully explain it. So there are other factors at bay. As I intimated in my previous answer, you know, the distal outflow resistance is probably what it's all about. And we've got no way of measuring it at the moment, uh, let alone determining preoperatively whether, you know, what it's, what it's likely to be. If we did, that'd be great. We'd know whether the patient's going to respond. Um, we also don't know how standalone ice dense compares with alternative glaucoma surgery, such as laser trabeculoplasty or glaucoma filtering surgery, because the studies haven't been done yet. However, there are studies underway um, and, you know, we will certainly get some answers. Um, in the next couple of years. And lastly, we don't yet know if ice stents are cost effective in terms of disease progression or quality of life. Um, but watch this space. As I said, quality of life studies are dependent on the country you live in, but we've actually done a cost utility analysis uh, in the Australian setting, and hopefully that will be published um, sometime soon. So that's the long and short of uh, I sense. Um, I'm happy to open up to the panel with uh, discussion and questions. Paul, thank you very much for such an, an amazing uh, talk and a very uh, valuable for all of us. Uh, clinically, uh, it's a very relevant paper and it kind of makes us think uh, about managing our patients slightly differently. I've got a couple of questions. I've, been, I've received a couple from the audience as well. And I've seen that we, we're lucky to have um, Imran Masood in the audience as well. So it'd be good to get his um, experience as well, uh, if we can open it up. So Elena, before I start with my questions, do you have anything uh, that you'd like to, to ask Paul? Uh, no, you can go ahead then. Yeah. Okay. So what I found interesting was um, there was a mean weight, weighted reduction at one year um, comparison of one stent versus multiple stents. And I think it was um, in one stent, it was, as you said, seven millimeters of mercury. Uh, in multiple stents, it was uh, 8.2 millimeters of mercury. And that was corroborated by a paper in 2014 by Malvan Karatel, uh, which you describe in the paper. So my first question is both to you and Elena, uh, your experience of multiple stents, um, should we be using more stents more often? And where would you implant them so that, they, that we can sort of educate uh, us all? Okay, well, look, uh, I mean, I think the caveat with the, the multiple stents is that, you know, there are a limited number of studies uh, which have compared one stent, the two stent and three stents, um, you know, relatively high quality study, but, but smaller number. So I would like to see more studies. Remember, we need consistent evidence uh, of effect. However, you know, I think from what we know from first principles, we know the canal stem is not continuous. We know it's segmental. Um, it makes sense to put stents in every segment, but we know the um, segmentation varies in every patient. Um, it is technically easier, of course, to put the stents somewhere along the nasal 180 degrees. Um, it's a little hard to, you know, sit on the patient and, and put it superiorly. Um, and uh, coming across the nose, you know, like us, big Europe, big nose Europeans, um, it can be very difficult. So look, I think, and I think also it would make, you know, it's reasonable to expect that you're going to maximize your effect, aren't you? I mean, you know, you're not gonna keep going till you get to episclerol the more stents you put in. Um, anecdotally, um, I certainly, you know, have, I've had a few patients where I put in you know, a couple of uh, G1 stents and they certainly seem to work better than a single G1 stent. For the I stent, I've, I've done fewer because they come in pairs, I've either put in two or I've put in four um, mm. and finding where you're gonna put the four in can be a little difficult. Um, the jury's out. I'm not, um, you know, I, I'm not convinced that four I stents works better than, uh, better than two. Um, but I think certainly Glaucos is, you know, who make the eye stent are pretty certain that, that uh, two eye stent injects work better than one. Elena, your experience? So yes, I have not done a meta-analysis meta and a such nice review and everything, of course, 
<clears throat> but my impression from my patients is like two stands do better. And also I try to space them, space them, like really making me myself a little uncomfortable even putting them like really uh, far apart, like at least like try to go for three hours, two to three hours. And I, I think they do a little better. Also making sure the location is, and when we teach uh, fellows and residents, that they don't insert them in the wrong space. Sometimes some eye stems end up injected in the scleral spur. I have a patient like from a different uh, hospital that had two eye stem injects, one place in the scleral spur and the other in the actually the ciliary body. So we may need to make sure that doesn't happen. They don't work well if you put them there. <laughs> um, okay, that, that's fantastic. So um, my second point uh, was, as you showed, the higher the pressure, um, you, 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 you'd expect to have uh, a lower reduction. And, and it was interesting to, to note some of the studies had a washout period, some didn't. And the indications were obviously variable from treatment naive patients to those almost requiring um, uh, filtration surgery. So similar reductions were noted when stratifying for the number of, of, of meds at baseline. So is that, is that kind of robust enough um, reassurance to say, we should be trying these more in advancing disease? And as I alluded to at the beginning, as glaucoma surgeons will have seen, I'm sure um, Imran, if we could open his microphone up as well, he would have noted the complications seen in these patients. Are we, can we buy time by doing eye stents? I'd respond first and say that um, uh, eye stents for standalone surgery were initially not approved in Australia. Um, and um, uh, I was involved in making the case to um, our government that they should be considered. And the case I made really was uh, one of delaying um, trabeculectomy. Um, if you look at the, and, and this is something that we, you know, we looked at in the cost utility analysis. Um, if you look at the standard outcomes, side effects of trabeculectomy surgery, if you look at the very substantial patient resistance to trabeculectomy surgery, particularly those who have consulted Dr. Google um, or YouTube, um, then you know there is a place, I think, for these devices to not, you know, obviously not in all patients, but in some patients to delay surgery. What I found interesting with the standalone meta-analysis, although there are only two studies of patients due for incisional surgery who had the stents, um, those patients at the end of the study hadn't had their definitive surgery. So, you know, it, it's like, you know, it's like doing a um, gonisonechiolysis in an angle closure patient who needs a trabeculectomy. I mean, um, I started doing them because, you know, I had a whole, whole lot of small eyes and I didn't want to, you know, I wanted to try and make it easy for myself to do the trab. And I ended up finding that I actually didn't have to do the trab in most of the eyes. So, you know, I, I think as long as we have a realistic idea, if someone, you know, has advanced glaucoma, their pressure's 40, it's not appropriate for an eye stent. Um, but if you've got a patient who needs a pressure of 15 and they're running at 20 and, you know, you're on max meds and they, you know, their mum had a trabeculectomy and went blind and they're never going to have that in their life, you need to get them to surgery somehow. And getting them to surgery with an intraocular glaucoma stent is going to bring them back to you when they need the trab saying, Oh, that operation was simple. I mean, the vision was great. I recovered really quickly. Um, you know, I'm ready to have the trabeculectomy now. Imran, good afternoon. Can you, can you, is your mic open? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you very much for joining us. Our pleasure. Pleasure, pleasure, pleasure to be here. Please, any questions or any points that you'd like to make to Paul, please? Yeah, Paul, first of all, fantastic piece of work. Um, congratulations. Um, I, I have to say, uh, my experience of uh, using standalone eye stents has been a little bit up and down. When I first started using the eye stent uh, about a decade ago, much like yourself, um, I went around placing it in ev 
any eye I could find, <laughs> to be honest. And um, we, we then learn and refine our, our, um, our technique. But what I found was that some patients it worked very well on. And in fact, I looked at a patient that I um, implanted standalone eye stents on a decade ago. Uh, he was um, a chap on four meds with Marfan syndrome, monocular patient um, with uh, you know, decent field loss. Um, and just very worried about losing his vision because he had lost vision in the other eye from glaucoma surgery a, a decade earlier uh, under another surgeon. And so, um, and those, and his pressure's been maintained at 13, albeit on still three medication at a decade and with no progression. So you do see some stunning results, I think, with that. Equally, I've had patients where I've tried it and it's not worked at all and I've had to resort to a filter. Um, so I'm very interested by your study, because it almost makes me feel like I need to go back and revisit um, inappropriate patients' um, um, uh, standalone stenting. I have got a couple of questions. Um, one is that historically, um, um, I know that certain papers have said that in certain types of glaucoma, like PXF, perhaps PDS, simply washing out of the anterior chamber can lower intraocular pressure. So. Yes, we're putting in these standalone eye stents. Do we have robust evidence that it's the eye stent or is it just washing out of the anterior chamber? That's one question. And the second question is that uh, there is a study by um, Kawe Mansuri and Kevin Gilman, which has looked at the positioning of the eye stents. And I think this is, a, this is also the, the elephant in the room um, in that the heterogeneity of the data um, and surgeons' different experiences could conceivably be explained by a uh, malposition of stents because we, we know that from the Gilman study when they looked at um, using anterior second OCT there was a variation in stent placement um, and a variation in the amount that the canal dilated post stent placement um, uh, probably because of where the stent was. So question one is the AC washout does that help in POAG do you think and is that a confounder here and the second point is placement of eye stents. I think we need to do more work in, in that area as well. Thank you very much. Thanks very much uh, for those points. Um, and uh, look, I'd echo that. I mean, um, I was, I mean, I thought the standalone stents would do better. I was a little surprised, uh, quite frankly, at how much better they did and how consistent that evidence was. Um, my own uh, group in terms of eye stent standalone is not as good as the best results of those studies, but you know, they're the patients we have. Look, in terms of the AC washout, um, you know, I do not think anterior chamber washouts have any prolonged effect. You know, I'm thinking back to a paper, now I might be wrong because it's in the depths of my memory, but I think Gunter Kriegelstein published something, I'm gonna show my age, it could be the early 2000s, it could be in the mid 90s, um, of a sort of a, uh, a vacuum cleaning of the trabecular meshwork. Um, which uh, looked fantastic um, at um, 12 months. Um, and you know, when I went searching for the rest of the follow-up, I found there was none. And when I investigated further, it was because it, it failed. Um, so you know, we, we, everyone listening to this needs to understand glaucoma. You know, the annals of glaucoma are full of failed procedures, which seemed to be good and have great short-term results, um, but don't work in the long-term. And, and I mean, you know, there are numerous, numerous procedures for glaucoma where that's the case. So it is really important if, you, if you've got a glaucoma procedure that it lasts, you know, really it needs to last five years. Now, interestingly, you know, there aren't many long-term medical studies. I mean, there was a 10-year latanoprost study, which only came out about 10 years ago. Um, but you know, long-term results are important. So my reading of the literature that relates to this sort of anterior chamber washout is that in the short term, yes, it can lower the pressure, but I've not seen anything that lasts more than um, a year. So I think there's something else going on here. Um, I think your patient is a perfect example. You know, I put, I put uh, a couple of eye standing jets in a adult genital glaucoma, you know, at a pressure of sort of 36 and was determined not to have sur you know, any surgery and, you know, he, he for the next three years he had pressures of thirteen. Um, so uh, you know, and he'd never had pressures that good. So you know, I, I think this is not just an anterior chamber washout. There's something generally going on. 
I think in terms of placement, I think you're absolutely right. Um, there are a few signs that we have of good placement, um, except for the pressure lowering. Intraocularly, uh, blood reflux, I think, is essential. Um, the trick I use, first of all, if you're going to do this as a combined procedure, now you may not have seen this lecture, but if you are, can I recommend you put the device in before you do the cataract surgery? Um, it's much easier to see. Uh, you do your, um, I mean, I always do my main wound before I do my paracentesis. And when I do it for these patients, I let the pressure drop down um, to about five or six. And then I bring it, and, and I, I take my time to get my viscoelastic, I bring it back up to about um, sort of 18 to 20. And when I put the gonia lens on, there's a lovely red line of all the blood that's refluxed back into Schlem's canal. And that's my target for my, you know, for my stent. You're not going to put it in the um, ciliary body or the scleral spur when you've got this lovely red band. Um, and when it goes into the, um, uh, when you deliver the eye stent, particularly the eye stent injects, you need to be certain it's actually sitting in the canal. It hasn't just pushed the canal um, wall away. And the way you see that is with the blood reflux. And if you don't get it, at the time you put it in because the pressure is running about 20. And if you try and put these in with really low pressure, um, it's very hard to get them to go in because the eye is, is too unstable. You get folds on the cornea, all sorts of things. Um, but when you do your cataract surgery, of course, the big fl the fluidics and the di uh, dynamic change of the IOP, um, inevitably, you know, when you go to put your, when you take out your uh, viscoelastic, at the end of the case, you'll get reflux. So that shows you you're in the right spot. If two stents are in the same segment of canal, I reckon, yes, you're going to get a maximal flow. So I agree entirely with Elena. Um, what I would recommend strongly for all of you who are learning this technique is come out of the eye, right? You know, go in superiorly, as superiorly as you can, implant that stent, come out of the eye, move the microscope, move your chair, move the gonia lens, go in again and go inferiorly as far as you can. It takes longer, but it's much easier to get your stents um, separated adequately. There is the, and I, again, we, I sometimes see this and I sometimes doesn't, and it doesn't always tell me I'm, uh, we're going to get a good result. But if you see blanching of the episcleral vessels um, after you put the stents in and you're putting a bit of um, BSS in the eye, then we always get a good pressure lowering. If you don't get the blanching, it doesn't necessarily mean it's not going to work. Um, but that's not that helpful really, because I mean, you put the stent in, you've got your blood, blood reflux. Um, what you really need to know is whether it's going to work beforehand. The only thing I can say about that is, you know, some investigators are doing some videographic studies of the uh, episcleral veins to see if we can get any clues in terms of velocity of flows, in terms of um, different flow volumes around the eye. Um, as to what the best target might be for these stents. But, you know, I mean, this is stent version 1.0. Uh, there's plenty of development to do to know how these work. I, I think the bottom line, and I have many colleagues who, realize, who really think these are just a waste of time and we should just all learn how to do proper trabeculectomies and not waste money. Um, these are expensive, right? A trabeculectomy costs, you know, apart from the surgeon's time, you know, a, a, a few pennies in, um, in suture material and mitomycin, uh, these things cost, you know, thousands of pounds. Um, however, uh, they are able to lower pressure very well for a very long time. We've just got to find the right patients to do it. Um, thank you very much. Uh, Elena, I've got a question from the audience I'd like you to, uh, to, to take. Um, and also, as well as this question, of course, you do a lot of training. Could you give surgical uh, tips for people learning off uh, this procedure. Uh, thank you kindly to Dr. Sachdev who asks, is there any evidence um, or, or your own experience that eye stent works in PACG patients um, who have had cataract surgery or VACO GSL? Um, could you answer those, that, that, those two points? Uh, yes, so for teaching first. Um, yeah, for teaching is one of the points that I, if I do a combined eye stent with a resident, 
um, more than the fellows, but the residents when they are starting, angle surgery is a, it has a steep learning curve for them because they are holding the lens with uh, the non-dominant hand. The dominant hands, they're in the eye, everything is so little. Sometimes they kind of, uh, they are not intentional with the first movement. There's hesitation, which is perfectly normal. And sometimes I've seen a uh, hymn, uh, and sometimes hymns that I'm concerned that that's going to make their uh, cataract surgery that is also not as proficient. And, and, and the little bit of blood reflux can affect the vision, the view of the for the surgery. So when I do with, uh, I train uh, with residents, I do like them to do the best uh, cataract surgery they can, and then later uh, do the eye stand with them. Um, for training, before we do uh, eye stands, we like them to uh, practice and have a good view with a lens and, and practice that positioning. Uh, what Dr. Haley was uh, talking, like uh, making sure your chair is comfortable, you rotate your, uh, and you are very, very comfortable. Uh, put be scholastic, have a good view, focus, um, and then um, just be intentional with the eye stand, with the second generation, with the inject, you do have a little needle. So pointing on the uh, trabecular meshwork between the pigmented and non-pigmented, uh, farther from the scleral spur, I think it's better to err slightly higher than lower, because most people, when we click with the bottom, we tend to go a little lower. In my hands, the problems I had when I started doing eye stents inject is like with my, my hands maybe a little smaller than other surgeons. And sometimes when I press the button, I tend to drag my needle um, so, so when I took it off, uh, the needle off, I scraped my eye stand out. So I did learn to, after I click, reposition, make sure my needle is very well centered on the uh, little uh, metal uh, surrounding the, the needle. And I uh, do that. And always, uh, yeah, always be sure uh, with the eye stand inject, you have four clicks. So make sure like uh, your position well, uh, you see well, and then just be intentional and go ahead and, and do it. Okay, and the uh, eye stent in uh, PAC-G patients who are now pseudophagic or GSL, your experience, thoughts? Uh, with I, I actually tend not to do this. I tend to open synechia, open the angle. Uh, they benefit from a cataract surgery. Tend not to do it. Uh, we do know that some eye stents can get synechia from the iris, even with open angles, completely open angles. Uh, I think that's one thing that could happen. The worst thing could happen is it would get like uh, closed and some uh, surgeons, I have never had that happen in my experience, but also probably because I haven't done on angle, angle closure. Um, but um, so some people, what they do is they just jag on top of it and open the, the bands of iris after the inflammation of the surgery has healed. I have done, however, other procedures like OVNI. So I have done on patients with primary upon angle closure that I want to, I do gonisicolysis and then I do uh, this and, and I do an OVNI. So that I have way more experience. I stand, I never personally did it. Uh, I think uh, Dan's going to kind of give us a session on OVNI soon and Small but delicate hands, of course. Uh, Paul, uh, could you give us a little bit of uh, your experience as well? Uh, so look, in terms of angle closure, um, I can only think of two studies. One's from Shan Lim's group in um, San Francisco and the other's from Children's Singh in Singapore. Um, as you'd expect, as Alina alluded to, um, uh, PAS to the stent is the main problem. Interestingly, in the Singapore study, you know, I think we had failure in 10% and PAS to the stent in 28%. So in other words, um, people were getting PAS to the stent, but the pressure was still coming down. However, we know cataract surgery is particularly effective at lowering intraocular pressure in um, angle closure. Um, so, you know, uh, I have certainly put them in patient very successfully after I've removed the cataract. Um, but I think the... Um, the cataract and the GS and the gonosinicolysis is probably the more important procedure. In terms of tips, look, you know, you need to learn how to do angle surgery. It's a whole different kind of surgery. Um, doing a cataract doesn't make you good at doing a trab and it's the same for angle surgery. Ideally, what I do with my trainees, I get them to do gonosinicolysis first um, uh, so that they're used to working the angle and, and, and working at arm's length. I, if you can do um, a goniotomy, then this is a cinch, but goniotomy is hard to do. And we don't have a lot of opportunity to do it now, uh, even in our pediatric rotations. Um, I think, um, look, I, I would actually still argue to do the eye stent first because, um, well, I guess it depends where your trainee, but for the trainees I have in, in, in Sydney who are competent FACO surgeons, 
in their third year out of five, uh, but coming onto the ice stand for the first time, then the difficult bit of the surgery is the ice stand. And uh, if they have an eye full of blood after the stent goes in, well, they just put the IA and take all the viscoelastic out, take the heme out, and then you know put fresh heme in to do it. I think it's a mistake to try and do a capsulorexis with an eye with lots of blood around it, uh, because you know what capsulorexes are like. You know you don't know you've lost it until you've lost it. So um, you know the, the the surgical rule always is if you get off track, get yourself back on track before you finish the surgery. Um, I think all the points Elena made about um, uh, positioning the hands and being too high or too low is correct. There are, there's a new kind of eye stent called an eye stent W, which has got a much larger ring. You can't really over implant it. Um, one of the things about the eye stent is that although you've got four clicks, each time you click, there's less torque. So what happens is that your first eye stent is always over implanted. And by the time you get to your last click, there's so little force that the thing doesn't go in. With the eye stent Ws, you don't have that problem. Um, you can use, if you keep a pressure around 18 to 20, if you use steady and moderately strong force to keep that um, uh, trocar against the trabecular meshwork and actually see the meshwork indent, and then you release, you wait four seconds, and you come straight back. In other words, you don't, you don't flex the, the, the trocar so that, the, that you create friction, um, then, um, you know, it, it, it usually works quite well. But like everything in surgery, you got to practice, practice, practice. I think um, I've got a lot, of the, a lot of my gang here today on the on the chat, and I, I think I echo that sentiment. I get them to do GSL first, which I think that's quite a nice way to get to see the angle and uh, then become comfortable. So I'm glad um, you, you corroborated that. I guess, um, for, uh, thank you, Dr. Ab by Yome uh, for sending a question. I'll forward that on to Paul separately. And I think it's a good time to wrap up here. Um, just to thank um, Paul, Elena, uh, Maria, and uh, and the audience, Imran, Yair, everyone who, who came on, uh, really appreciate it. It's been a fascinating session and uh, it's a really good way to kick back off um, our, our sessions, which we're gonna to try to do um, monthly uh, with either Omni or what to do when a tube is not enough uh, next. Um, we'll make it available so that you guys can have a look um, and uh, revisit some of the interesting presentation. And we'll try to do a little bit of a, a, a summary as well. So it's, it's, a, it's available for everyone. So thank you, Paul, once again, for an amazing paper, an amazing talk.